I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where we amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 208 of the podcast today. So welcome to Rochester Rising, whether this is your first time listening in or if you're a frequent listener in to this weekly podcast. This is our first brand new conversation of 2021. So here at Rochester Rising, really our main goal is to amplify stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. This includes first-time entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, and people who have been running established businesses for years in the community. Really, the goal with the podcast is to talk about the culture of entrepreneurship and business development here in the Rochester, Minnesota community, and to chat with entrepreneurs to learn how they're building or have built their business in the community, and what drives them to be entrepreneurial every day. So today, for our first brand new conversation of 2021, we share with you a conversation we had with Bethany Morrissey, who is the program director at Just for Kicks Rochester. We recorded this podcast with Bethany in late December, in person, socially distanced, and masked in our podcast recording booth at Collider Coworking. So I have a really full conversation with Bethany to share with you today. So for those of you not familiar with Just for Kicks, it's a business that was started by two entrepreneurs, Cindy and Steve Clue, in Brainerd, Minnesota, 35 years ago, uh, really just to, to teach kids dance. Now, 35 years later, Just for Kicks is in 200 different locations nationwide, with each local location run by a program director, such as Bethany. And throughout these multiple locations, Just for Kicks engages with over 21,000 dancers, with the mission to change lives one dancer at a time. So in the podcast today, we talk with Bethany about how she initially got interested in dance and how she transitioned her career from a job in nuclear medicine at Mayo Clinic into her role as program director at Just for Kicks Rochester. And during this conversation today, we talk about what helped make that decision for her and how she saw being program director at Just for Kicks Rochester and taking on that responsibility, actually providing the best flexibility and allowing her to make the best decision for herself and her family. Bethany's a very goal-oriented person, which we'll hear a lot coming through in the podcast today. And I thought that was really inspiring, especially as we look forward to 2021 and what all of us listening in want to accomplish. And I certainly, it was very helpful to me to think about what I want to accomplish this year and also how to frame my mindset to instill confidence in myself to help me achieve those goals. So make sure you stay tuned to the end where Bethany gives some really great tips about positive mindset and growth-oriented mindset that I don't think any of you want to miss. So her goals and her passion caused Bethany to be voted the best Just for Kicks director in 2020. So on the show today, we talk about her priorities when she first became program director about 10 years ago with Just for Kicks Rochester, how she grew the business from 67 dancers when she started to the close to 737 she has today. We talk a lot about other hurdles she had to overcome during her time as program director, especially finding different locations for the business. So Just for Kicks Rochester actually was the last tenant in Collider Coworking or was the last space occupant where Collider Coworking is today. So that was kind of a fun conversation uh, that we had about the space evolving or changing over time. And we actually, I actually learned that where our podcasting booth is at Collider and where we record most of the Rochester Rising podcast or did when things weren't socially distant was actually a storytelling corner when Just for Kicks Rochester was in this space. So it was kind of an interesting thread that was pulled through both of these businesses and times. And of course, today we talk about on the podcast about the COVID pandemic and really just and talking about Bethany's goals and her drive to inspire kids to take their birth journey in life and really to help each child understand that they matter. So this is a wonderful conversation to start out our new podcast of 2021. So stay tuned. 
to this conversation with Bethany Morrissey, Program Director at Just for Kicks Rochester. A reminder to all of you that Rochester Rising is the storytelling arm of Collider. Collider is a Rochester-based nonprofit that supports entrepreneurs through events, education, space, and storytelling. You can find out more about Collider and what that organization has to offer at Collider.mn. We put out a brand new Rochester Rising podcast every Wednesday, so stay tuned. And we also have many other podcasts, articles, videos, and other stories showcasing and telling the story of entrepreneurs in Rochester on our website at rochesterrising.org. All right, so let's launch into today's podcast with Bethany Morrissey, Program Director at Just for Kicks Rochester. Thanks so much for doing this today, Mm -hmm. being here before Christmas and the holidays. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) It's a busy time back in a space very familiar to you, which I'm sure we'll talk about. (laughs) Yes, it's very cool to be back here, for sure. But yeah, it was to start out, I was interested in learning how you originally got interested in dance. Uh, well, originally, I um, back in high school, I would say I was an athlete in basketball and soccer and um, had good friends that danced, and I just enjoyed being with my friends, so I tried out for the dance team, um, actually here in Rochester with the John Marshall High School, and happened to make the team. And really enjoyed uh, my experience with dance and um, didn't have necessarily the training in dance. I just learned it uh, very naturally. And um, from there, it just established into a passion of mine. And from there, decided uh, I went to Luther College, which is in Decorah, Iowa, and continued to pursue dance there through classes and their dance team and choreography and uh, just really enjoyed the artistry of it, um, it, the camaraderie of it, and um, just the ability to express through through motions. And um, from there, I was not planning on continuing with dance, um, education, or teaching. And my sister was a junior at high school, and they were looking for a dance team coach. And I happened to be coming back to Rochester after I got my degree at Luther and pursue nuclear medicine at the Mayo Clinic. So I was on an entirely different track. (laughs) I was, um, I graduated with a double major in biology and psychobiology and neuroscience. So I was more doing dance just for for fun and just for myself. Mm -hmm. And um, they were looking for a coach and without uh, an adult coach present, they weren't going to be able to continue with the dance team at the high school. And so, um, I decided to apply and started off with helping my sister out by letting them have a dance team at the high school and started coaching. And I coached at John Marshall high school for eight years as a head coach there. So I stuck with it and also coached at Mayo high school for two years through that um, time frame, I got married and started having kids, and something had to go. And I decided that I was going to leave what I had planned my whole life over, which was medicine, um, and dance and raise my children. And so with that um, being said, with my high school coaching path and career, I met Cindy Clow, who Uh, is still the head coach of the Brainerd Kicksters dance team up in Brainerd. And she happens to be the uh, owner of Just for Kicks, which is where I now work. So uh, through that, I started judging for Just for Kicks. And over time, her and a couple of uh, her employees reached out to me about taking over uh, what we call a program in a community, which I was in Rochester. So she was pursuing me for about three years to be the director here in Rochester. They wanted to see some changes with the program that was already established here. And I believe when I took it over, it had been in the Rochester community for about 10 years. And so it had a presence, but for the size of the community, um, they felt that it, it could be a lot more or a lot bigger and reach more families and more youth. And so after baby number two for me, um, I finally decided to take it on. 
And so hence that started my journey with Just for Kicks here in Rochester. That's such so. a cool story because it starts from like, you know, this opportunity yeah. that you don't even think, you know, you're just going to do this to help somebody out. Like yeah. going, you know, going back to a passion and like a... Yeah. Uh, escape almost mm-hmm. that you have. Yeah, and <laughs> it was. And it and I learned so much. You know, it's hard because what I do is I teach, I teach dance and definitely quality is super important for what, what these kids are learning. And I wanted families to have quality dance education and looking at myself, how much I was able to learn outside of a studio and not being professionally trained for that matter, you know, and, you know, taking my own classes, learning from professors, uh, learning from just, just for kicks in general, all of these, um, necessities needed to have quality instruction. And I just really think that God had a calling for me with that. And it just, I was a sponge and I could take it all in and I could train anything now at this point, you know, and I just think continually learning is, you know, what makes me better every day. But, um, yeah, the journey looking back is, is kind of, it's just weird, you know, (laughs) that you have this idea of what you're going to do and then you just slowly gravitate somewhere else. So, yeah, I want to dive into that a little bit. Yeah. But first I want to ask just so kind of everyone knows before, you know, we talk more, can you talk a little bit more about what is, kind of just for kicks Mm -hmm. um like when someone goes there the one in rochester Mm -hmm. what can they expect yeah i think that's a great question um just for kicks as a company has been around for 40 years and it started out of cindy clow's basement essentially and because she had a passion for teaching children and as they were working through that they felt hey why don't we inspire other people that have the same passion to teach children to have essentially a business within their own communities and try to reach more kids. And so that's where it all stemmed from. And so the mission has always been the same over those 40 years, changing lives one dancer at a time. And um, we see our customers, if you'd say, more as family. So every kid that walks in the door, I want to know who they are, I want to know what their their goals are. Even when they're two years old, I want to I want to know that child and and how I can help them not just as a, as a dancer or a beginning dancer, but help them find their passion for life. And for some, they might stay with me till they're eighteen. Mm-hmm. Others, maybe dance isn't their passion, but they had a really positive experience and took away something to their their next journey. Um, so I would say, you know, when you walk in the door or give me a phone call at Just for Kicks. It's all about what can I do for you? What are you looking for? And a lot of what we do, um, I always say to my families, teamwork makes the dream work. And I stand by that philosophy because it can't just be on my shoulders. It has to be what we are all working towards in the end, which is a common goal of having fun, quality instruction, great relationships, um, building self-confidence, and dance just happens to be a fantastic avenue for that so so yeah so you're aimed primarily at I don't like what age can you start yeah with students and then it seems like it goes up to yeah high, end of high school yeah so Rochester itself has developed definitely over time with the how the program has been set up and so when I when I started predominantly just for kicks is looking at youth so Usually it's like preschool age all the way to like your seniors in high school. Um, so every program has has the capability of developing then what that is within their community. Since Rochester is so large and there was there was a need and um, a, a passion for both what I was doing and just dance in general, um, we now offer classes from two years of age um, all the way up through adult. So this last this this let's see last season we started offering like drop-in classes for adults even so they just come in they take a take a hip-hop class and they can call it a day if they want um so it's really expanded to 
hit all ages. Um, some of our favorites too are things like father daughter or mother daughter events that we've done over Mother's Day, and so we even get the parents involved. But as far as weekly instruction, it's two years of age to eighteen okay. is typically our target um, market, and um, we offer classes of all styles. So. Uh, our, our main class, or our core class, is called a kick class. And um, with that class, you're getting, like, the fundamentals of stretching and strengthening. And if you've ever heard of, like, the New, New York City Rockets. <laughs> I just saw them on TV. Yeah, exactly. So they're, they're predominantly kick and performance okay. and precision. And um, if you're familiar with, like, the high school dance teams, their main style is that they compete with is kick and jazz. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, we're training the dancers for that avenue. So, you know, that high school dance team or that collegiate dance team. And so we call, like, our littlest of dancers are called teeny kicks, K-I-X, okay? Um, so they're just learning the fundamentals, um, through all those kick classes, but then you can start to branch out to other styles of dance. So we have um, jazz and ballet uh, technique, so just kids that are wanting to grow in their turns or their leaps or their jumps. Um, we have lyrical, we have hip hop, we have tap, we have contemporary. <laughs> so really there's something for for anyone that's interested in trying different styles. So it's, yeah. Super cool. I've been looking for a drop in adult <laughs> tap class. Ah! I was like, I used to, you know, take dance. I was not very good, good at it. And, and so, like, we have on my fridge at home now, mm -hmm. like, a, I don't know, you'd have your recital every year. Yep. And, I mean, this was, like, 1992. And okay. And black leotard with, like... <laughs> Lime green and hot oh, funny. pink, like poof. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm pretty sure it was like a Little Mermaid sure. type thing. Sure, type, you know. Sounds wonderful. Uh, yeah, <laughs> part of this world, you know. Yeah. Routine. Oh yeah. So yeah, I see that every day when I go to my fridge. That's fantastic. <laughs> Just, my yeah. mom thought it would be funny to send it to me, oh. like a class from the past. But <laughs> why not? Why not? Yeah, the adult classes are really fun just because it's lower commitment and you can just. Yeah, like even someone like yourself, it's like you maybe used to dance or you just enjoyed going to dance, but you're not, you know, you're you're in a different stage of life now. But that doesn't mean you still don't like to dance, you right. know. So the drop-ins have been really fun and, you know, it's just low commitment, low cost and just to get some exercise again and return to a studio for fun, yeah. you know. So, so yeah, that's where we're at. <laughs> and I think it's super cool. So it started out of Brainerd, you said. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now... I know we talked about this before, like how many different, I don't know what you would call them, studios or mm -hmm. satellites are there, Yeah. So mainly in Minnesota, but now it's started to like really branch out. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question because it's, it's really, uh, it's really taken off as far as the company side of things. And so the main location, yes, is in Minnesota because that's where Just for Kicks was founded. But now we're at a point where there's um, over 220 programs in 11 states so um, again the bulk of those are in your in Minnesota um, and so I'm what you call the program director of Rochester so I'm one of those 220 um, programs and um, so it has grown I want to say last year we were we were at 28,000 dancers wow. within the United in those programs and so it's it's really grown a lot, and Rochester's been an amazing journey for me as a director, just tapping into the potential of our community and our families and these kids. Um, it's just been really fun. When I started, so they call what they call me as a turnover director because it was in existence prior to me taking it over. And when I took it over, um, just for Kicks Rochester was at um, 67 uh, students. And this is my 10th year with Just for Kicks. And we are at, I think today when I looked, we were at like 737. It's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, but the, the mission and how we do things and how we teach and inspire is all the same. You know, the numbers are great, but it's just... It, 
it's a it's just a teamwork feel and every kid that walks through that door is just awesome you know and they're taking away just so much beyond just dance and so I really feel like the way I've structured it our culture um people have gravitated to that and they've really enjoyed it if if dance was what their child is looking for so yeah can you talk about you know as um program director here in mm-hmm. Rochester, kind of what are your responsibilities in kind of maintaining yeah. the business here? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, as a director, um, I have the luxury of not having to do things like marketing or uh, payroll. <laughs> so I have employees that work under me, but essentially they are employed by Just for Kicks. So for example, my my job is to hire them and make sure that they're right for Rochester. Um, but just for kicks handles, um, all the, the payroll side of things with it. Um, I have a marketing rep at just for kicks up in Brainerd, but I make the decisions on what that marketing is. For example, like a, like a Facebook boost or something like that. So if I feel that that's a need here, I want to advertise for a class coming up, I make that decision and, um, just for kicks, will guide me then through that and and make that happen for me. Um, Other decisions are location, you know, where we hold dance classes, uh, my curriculum, how I go about that. There is a base curriculum through Just for Kicks, uh, but our program has expanded so much that it involves so many different styles, and so I have guidance from my home office, but I make those decisions and how, how I go about it, how long are those classes, um, what teachers are involved, how many students are involved, what competitions they go to. Um, so really I have control over the decisions that are specific to Rochester with the help, advice, and guidance from the Brainerd office. Mm-hmm. I think that's so important, too, because every market is so different, mm-hmm. and it's really going to kind of sink or swim based on what you're seeing yeah. and what you're kind of able to implement into those decisions. Right, right. Well, and like I said, Rochester is very different from, say, Stewartville. Absolutely. Stewartville has a program. They're eight miles away, and the decisions that that director has to make are different than mine, depending on you know what they're trying to reach out for or communicate to. And so it's... It's really cool in the sense that, you know, I didn't buy into a franchise. I'm not trying to start up my own business. But ultimately, the decisions that I make will be whether or not the program is successful here in Rochester. So I kind of get that luxury of feeling like I'm my own boss, right, um, and and have a handle on what's going on in my community, which makes it kind of fun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. It's interesting that there's one in Stewartville, and that was enough distance that yeah. like, you're not pulling from the same kits. Yeah, no, it is. It's really cool. There's actually, so you probably might be surprised. So there's a program in Byron. There's a program yeah. in Casson. <laughs> there's a program in Plainview. There's a program in Cannon Falls. Um, there is a program in Spring Valley, Green Meadow, Austin, Owatonna. I mean, I could That's go on. Lot, yeah. So, um, I mean, just within this area... There's at least six to eight, um, and you're exactly right. I mean, we're eight miles, you know, eight miles to maybe 30 miles away from each other, and we're all successful. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, again, it's because there's a need in that community, and um, and we're hired to do a great job, you know, following that mission of Just for Kicks, and and we're all successful in our own ways. Yeah, I think that points out, too, that, you know, every people look at other things as such competition, but it's mm. really not. You know, it's yeah. figuring out who your customers are and going yeah. after them because yours are different than yeah. Byron and yeah. Stewartville, yep. even though they could easily drive here. Yep, you and know? I do and I do have I do have families that do, you know, it, it, and I think that's what's cool, too, is families um, always have the choice, right, of what they want for their child and what's working for them and what businesses... Um, they feel pulled to, you know, in, in any area. And I, that, I just think that's cool. So, yeah, I do have families from outside that drive to, to me for classes, but it just could mean that they're looking for something different than what is being currently offered in their community. And I would say I'm very blessed in that sense because I am so large. I'm able to have a facility. So the other thing that's very different is, uh, you know, programs – 
in choosing where they can go and um, for their for their classes. Um, I'm one of a few that actually am in a building that we lease, and um, most are actually out of churches mm-hmm. or um, out of like an Eagle Center mm-hmm. or maybe their local high school, um, and they're just as popular and as successful. I just like I said, I'm just very fortunate to be able to be in a leased situation um, where I have more flexibility to offer more when I want to and um, fill the needs where, where they come up. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I want to just circle back to, you know, you had this totally different career path that you thought you were going to go down in nuclear medicine. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I have a PhD in molecular biology. Oh, do you? So totally, like, understand, you know, you're going down one path and you're yeah. like, nope, this just isn't yeah. for me. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of people listening probably are thinking that if they haven't done it already, they're mm-hmm. like, they're realizing they're mm-hmm. not where they want to be. Mm-hmm. Like, can you talk about, take people back to like, what was that decision and thought process like mm-hmm. from you, like what were conversations you were having with like family? Because yeah. a lot of the times we don't yeah. do that. Right. What was that like for you and how did that, how did you make the final decision to, to take that jump? Yeah, I think that's a really, really great question. <laughs> Going back in time, where was I at? You know, I think ultimately where it came down to was I saw an opportunity to do something that I felt I had control over. Um, and like I said, I had two little ones at that time. And so I was working full time, um, at the clinic here and then coaching high school dance and then had two babies and I felt something had to give somewhere, right? Cause we only have so much time and my babies are my babies, you know? And so with support definitely of my husband, a hundred percent, you know, I decided to take the path where I felt I had the flexibility Mm -hmm. to either work less or work more, make more, make less, you know, and I've always been very goal driven. And, um, I felt with the director position that I was being offered and knowing that there could be so much more done for our high school dance teams because I was coaching, you know, at the same time. And I felt these kids could use more. And I looked around Rochester and there was really no feeder program, if you want to say that, feeder program to get into high school dance team. And so I saw a need at the same time. So it's like, okay, I'm really good at teaching. I'm really good with kids. Um... I want to be able to stay home with my kids, you know, and um, seeing how much potential there was in Rochester. And so I believe that's ultimately, you know, through prayer and talking with my husband too, but I believe that was ultimately what was the driving force was there's not a feeder program here. Mm -hmm. So why can't it be me? And here's an avenue through Just for Kicks that is set up to be a feeder program for high school dance team. And let's just do it, you know? And so I guess that's really where I was in that point in time, so. Well, it sounds like you were very confident about your decision. You know, you just made yeah. the decision and there really wasn't any, like, yeah. wavering on it. There wasn't much wavering on it, you know? I think it was probably more the deciding factor of having, you know, two little ones at home, you know? And my husband works as well, so it was it's always a sacrifice when you make those changes, but it was the right sacrifice for our family. And I think that's always, you know, what we have to look at, you know, when we're, when we're looking at choices given to us, you know, and, um, I just, I just felt that this was the right call for me and I haven't wavered from it. And it's only gotten where my workload has exponentially <laughs> increased it isn't an eight to five job anymore you know I I it's crazy how much I work but there is truth to you know whatever what's that saying like you find what you love you never yeah. work a day in your life a hundred percent agree with that a hundred percent I don't feel like I work when I enter the doors at the studio I don't feel like I'm working when a parent calls asking questions about a uniform 
it's customer service, it's fun. Um, I like solving problems, <laughs> you know? Um, partially probably because I'm a people person too with that, but um, yeah, no, I'm not wavering at all. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's really exciting. It's funny, a lot of times I think when we feel like we're, you know, taking on all this responsibility that we're going to lose control of everything else, but we almost like, I feel like a lot of people gain control yeah. and have that flexibility mm-hmm. then when you take on more responsibility. Like, it's a complete paradox, but it seems to be yeah. true the majority of the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and I just, I just go back to, you know, once I made that decision, it was, you know, I, I wanted to be on fire with it. You know, I... I didn't want to just show up and and do something I loved. I really wanted to take it on and see what could happen here in Rochester if I did this and if I did this, you know. And I could do all of that and make all those decisions with my kids at home. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, you know, my husband's been very supportive through it where um, I could go and teach dance classes and he would be home then with the girls, you know? And so it was definitely a partnership in making that decision. And I mean, like I told you, when I took it over, there was 67, 67 students. And by year three, we had jumped to 250. So it wasn't like it took 10 years. Mm -hmm. There were these moments in life that were like, holy cow, how am I going to handle my own life plus what's going on here? And it was so exciting and so rewarding seeing these things pay off, um, which is what kept you going, you know. And then eventually my kids got old enough where then I <laughs> threw them into dance classes with me. And it was an opportunity then to spend time with them by being their dance teacher too. So Yeah. So when you first became program director mm-hmm. 10 years ago, you know, what were some of your first priorities? And can you talk about how you accomplished them or yeah. or maybe didn't and, and changed a little bit from your original thoughts? Yeah, well, one of the biggest things I had when I took it over was trying to figure out, answering the question of why isn't this, why isn't, Just for Kicks was, is huge and um, very well known throughout the dance community. And it's Rochester's so large, and yet why was it not so successful? What was Why wasn't Just for Kicks successful here in Rochester? And um, so that was my first task, was going through, you know, the decisions that have been made in the past and trying to essentially flip it, mm-hmm. right? And so one of the first things I did was um, find a location, okay? I felt Rochester, um, I felt was almost an... Uh, positively image-based community and I felt that families were looking for something to call home Um, not that renting a church or renting a gym or anything like that was not okay because it is and people are very successful with that but I felt for Rochester to flip it we had to do something different and so one of my first pursuits was finding (laughs) somewhere in Rochester within a very low budget Mm -hmm. um, to call home for Just For Kicks, which ironically, like we said on the phone, (laughs) I'm sitting in the building where Bobby Harrell owned it and got me up here. And I believe with her passion for her past with dance was why she let me in these doors. Mm -hmm. And my parents and my husband, I mean, we painted the scaffolding, we painted everything, we cleaned it up just to get it up and running again. And um, we called this location home for three seasons. Mm -hmm. And it did. I mean, it proved that having a home, knowing that you were going to your Just For Kicks dance studio, um, started to pay off. So that was one of the first things. And then the second thing was changing the image. Um, So promoting me as the new director and and what's my background and what do I know and um, what am I offering and free classes and open houses and just opportunity for people to ask questions and being available so that was the first first big task was almost an image flip Mm -hmm. so 
it is so crazy that, yeah, Just for Kicks was in this co-working space. Mm-hmm. You know, it probably was the last tenant before the co-working space. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I knew, I always knew there was it was a dance studio, mm-hmm. but I didn't know which one. So mm-hmm. it has to be, like, a weird, <laughs> a weird feeling to come in here and see, it's like, cool. what... It's Where so things cool. were. So what was in the service elevator? <laughs> so the service elevator actually served as an emergency exit and storage okay. closet. So we never used that. Um, and it was definitely creepy, but... I mean, it's still kind of creepy. <laughs> I mean, there's a floor there now. So you yeah, can't really yeah. Go so we just, yeah. But where we're sitting right now, we called um, our storytelling alcove. Okay. And so we had... Um, benches in here and um books um when we had little camps this is where we would sit with the kids and read some type of dance related story or if it was a princess camp we'd read a princess book um you know if there was a you know like a team bonding type of situation we would sit over here together and talk on the carpet because everything else was hardwood um so lots of really great memories uh in this space for sure um, I was chuckling, I know, on the phone with you that the outside of the building, you can still see the staircase going up. And every time I drive by here, I'm, a, I'm always, I always say, oh, thank you, dear Jesus, that everyone's still locked up those oh, stairs yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. to come up um, to have dance class because it was, so, you know, such a, such a challenge. It was so, yeah. so high with all those stairs. And people did it. Once they got up here, it was, okay, now we're dancing, you know, right. and they'd forget about those stairs. But, um yeah, this is essentially where it all started for me with my journey, and it's it's cool to be back in here. <laughs> so did you move right from this location to the location on... It's on Broadway, right? Right. On it's Broadway. on it's South Broadway, and no, okay. actually, um, when this building was sold, it was, okay, what, what do we do next, you know? Mm-hmm. And we were in a definitely a high-growth time, and needing to figure out what to do and um through a handful of uh phone calls and conversations with people even utilizing my own dance families you know Mm -hmm. hey do you know somewhere that's available to lease or an empty space and um because you know gyms and like uh just different locations that were normal for just for kicks directors to pursue wasn't normal for rochester i had to find something that we could call home. And with parents being on board with me, there was a transition year. And I wouldn't say it was a growth year. It was, we're sticking with you, Beth, type mm-hmm. of year. And we're, we're going we're gonna to stay with you and hope that we can find something after the fact. So in this transition year, we were at uh, Holy Cross Lutheran Church. Okay. We were at Bethel Lutheran Church. And we were actually um, where... Uh, uh, Powers Ventures Canadian Honker location with oh, yeah. the hotel, their yeah. ballrooms. So for an entire nine month season, we bounced around between those three locations. And now I'm Type A, so I like to have everything laid out yeah. for the entire season. And I had to grow myself and become more flexible, mm-hmm. knowing that we were in three different locations. And as did those families, because it could change. Mm-hmm. You know, someone could end up having a banquet and so now we can't have dance class there and (laughs) okay now I gotta call Chris at Powers to see if they can squeeze us into a ballroom for this night and it could be the the next day so there was a lot of um communication that had to take place and um oh just patience you know and flexibility but I learned a lot I grew a lot during that year and um at the end of the day uh Bucky Beeman uh here in Rochester found where I'm at now and the landlord there, who's he's been fantastic, and he took us on, and we, um, that was kind of our, our my first experience as far as doing like a build out situation and getting uh, contractors involved from the city and all that stuff. So I learned so much into what goes into a building <laughs> that wow. year um, to create the space we needed where we're currently at, and after. I believe it was two years of being where we're currently at. We actually added a third space within the location we're at. So now we have three large studios and an office within the building that we're at now. So 
has to be a good feeling to find a home again. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. have parking. <laughs> oh, yeah. The parking's been great. And like I said, the location, I couldn't ask for anything better being, you know, like how we talked about pulling from all different communities, you know. Um, that's what Mayo does and OMC. You know, all these employments, people live outside of Rochester. And to be able to find a location that is accessible um, is difficult. And yeah. so for a year when I was <clears throat> bouncing around between those three spaces, that's all I did. That was where my stress level was, was where can we go? Mm-hmm. Where can we go? Where do I go with all of these families and all of these kids? And it was a huge weight on my shoulders, even though I knew I, knew I had the support, you know, driving it. It's, it wasn't easy, mm-hmm. you know, and... Um, so finding it was a blessing, having, you know, the right people at the right time willing to work hard to get things done for you to open your doors, you know, by a certain time frame, And, um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So you said when you, you know, first took over one of those strategies is really kind of to figure out what wasn't working in the community and mm-hmm. kind of get more of your, you know, kids into the program. Mm-hmm. So can you talk through, like, some strategies that were successful to you or that you tried out to get people in the door, Mm -hmm. figure out exactly who you were supposed to be targeting and connect with them? Yeah. I think that's a great question because I think it's so important, you know, in trying to grow and figure it out. Um, I felt, number one, word of mouth was huge, but the only way I could get – because I felt good about what I was offering, but how do I tell people – without tooting your own horn, but trying to toot your own horn at the same time, you know what I mean? That what is going to happen is going to be great in our community. And so it started, I would say, a lot with offering free. Um, Or, like, free classes or open houses. Mm -hmm. Um, Just an opportunity for people to see you in action. Um, An opportunity for them to ask questions. And then as it you know, grew and took on, then I started to ask my families to reach out to others. And not where it was uh, an odd request, like, please recruit five kids, you know, or whatever like that. (laughs) No pyramids. No, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) I wasn't about that because I didn't need that. But I, you know, to get moving in the direction that I was looking for, it couldn't be just on me, you know, Mm -hmm. advertising is huge. What, what, what do people look at these days? You know, and that's almost evolved too from, being your, you know, papers or hard copies of things has now moved into the social media wave, you know, and tackling that and then how to target through social media. And, but I have found, um, I think the biggest way I have grown is through word of mouth. Um, and asking people, you know, Hey, if you like it and you think this is great, if your friend is looking for something Mm -hmm. for your, their child to do, just, Mention just for kicks, you know. Um, I would say when I first started, too, it was like I did flyers, you know, to the schools. Now the schools are all digital, so you send them a digital flyer. (laughs) But, you know, it saves money on a different end, you know. But, um, you know, but flyers going to businesses. I remember um, one of the craziest, it's not even crazy, but I would go to all the banks (laughs) And, um, you know, their little uh, little tube system, I'd pull into oh, their yeah. drive through and I would send a flyer through the tube. <laughs> and they're like, can, you know, can we help you? And I'm like, well, if you have a break room, if you're willing to put this in your break room. And they're like, some would be like, oh, we can't do that, you know. And others are like, sure, why not, you yeah. know. So it's just kind of funny. You just have to try different things. Um, I did yard, I still do this, yard signs, you know, are a big okay. thing. Um, so it's not that like the hard copy stuff, it has gone away by any means. I, I don't even know what it is now with marketing. I think someone has to see it like 21 times before they actually decide to look into it, yeah. you know? So, um, and not everybody's on social media, right. so you still have to try to target all these different things. But, um, oh, I offered going to daycares and preschools and, um, elementary schools for their PE classes, mm-hmm. you know, to, um teach you know for fun and yeah so through all of that it just just kept evolving and then I think the word of mouth 
Yeah. So. So you really tried everything. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I really, I think the only thing that I have yet to do, which I don't think I will ever, ever do, but one of the big things that other directors had done was putting flyers on people's cars. Mm. And I don't know if it's because I, I enjoy my car or whatever, and I don't want people touching my car, but the idea of yeah. putting a flyer on a, everybody's car, I just, I've never pursued that, so. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people have car alarms, too. So I know, I, like, I don't want to get, like, arrested putting a flyer on someone's <laughs> car. But yeah, I think yeah. a lot of times, like, we forget how simple and easy it is just to say, hey, if you enjoyed this, like, mm-hmm. consider, like, recommending it. I mean, there's nothing, like, pushy about that at yeah. all. Because yeah. you should, and if they aren't having a good time, mm-hmm. that's a good opportunity to have a conversation yeah. about why. Well, and I think, too, um, you know, the, the kids, the dancers are your biggest advertisement, too, right? So parents are fantastic because they, they're paying the bills, right? Yeah. So they want to make sure they have, you know, what their child needs. And, but at the end of the day, the kids are the ones that are entering the studio and working for you, mm-hmm. you know, and, and learning and growing. And so they have to be the ones that feel inspired, mm-hmm. you know, when they're out with their friends and they're talking about, you know, oh, I can't go tonight because I have dance. Well, is that a negative or is that a positive? I want my dancers to be like, oh, I can't, I have dance, but you know, I dance, whatever. And then it's like, well, hey, you're not doing anything. Why don't you join dance with me? So I feel like the kids are a big source of, our, of my, my growth, too, mm-hmm. because they dance friends make the best friends. <laughs> we always say that at dance class, you know? So, yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about COVID because I feel like we mm. can't have a conversation about business in 2020 without COVID. So oh, yeah. Can you talk about, you know, obviously that's impacted the dance studio. Mm-hmm. I believe, were you allowed to open now again? Yeah. Um, okay, so you're open, I guess it's the 21st. Yep. Um, yep. So can you talk through, you know, what that has been like mm-hmm. for, for you and mm-hmm. just for kicks? I would say um, it's been both challenging and overwhelming and overwhelming in a good way um I'll talk about the challenging first so challenging if you go back to I can even remember the date March 14th because we were supposed to be having a stage show and I decided two days prior to the 14th to cancel it because there was just all this conversation of this COVID right and it was kind of like well what is it you know and all of a sudden on the 14th, you know, schools were closing and businesses had to shut down and it, it kind of just flipped things and for everybody in all states of whatever their livelihoods were. Right. And for the dance studio, um, you know, I now have 18 employees too. So, and then have X number of dancers, right? And then all their and their families. And so it was all of a sudden I felt like I had the weight of all of that, plus not knowing what was going on myself, right? <laughs> and trying to almost fake it like until I could make it type of thing. So it took some time during that chaos to to try to figure out the best route and still save your your business side of things. And so we went virtual in April and May. And um, I think the virtual idea was good, but still very foreign for everybody, not understanding what that all was and how it could work. Um, When we were, and and, and we did well, we did okay. Um, We had some loss in there as far as on a business standpoint, just for kicks as a company had loss um, with that. Um, as well but I feel in Rochester families continued to be supportive continued to work through it because at the end of the day they wanted just for kicks to be back so that's the overwhelming side right Um, the support financially not understanding what maybe is going on you know Um, get into we usually do things in the summer you know, and so finally we were able to open up in July for in person. Um, and the month of June, I just did tons of research, to be honest, tons of research on on all different types of businesses, similar to mine, um, 
hospitals, what they were doing, you know, just kind of looking at everything and because things seem to change too. It right? changed really fast. It should just change, yeah. and, and, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, so it's, again, it's that weight of the safety, mm-hmm. right? If I'm going to open my doors again for kids or families to be, and employees to be mm-hmm. in in the building, that's a lot of weight, right, to say that we're safe, you know? So through that research, um, you know, and working with, with my home office, um, we were able to open our doors per the, uh, you know, the governor's um, mandates and restrictions, um, but it looked very different. So a few, well, we've done a lot, but what looked really different? Kids had to wear masks. Mm-hmm. Uh, parents or family or outside guests were not allowed in the facility. Um, and all of these things right now are still true. So even though we, we had to close down uh, the week prior to uh, Thanksgiving break, mm-hmm. All of this stayed true up until that point. So um, masks, uh, families could not come in. Preschool families, they could have one parent come in with them. Um, And a lot of it was to meet capacity uh, needs. Class sizes were reduced, meaning there were more classes offered to accommodate the numbers. Um, uh, Like a grid situation was taped on all floors to really visualize that social distancing mm-hmm. that was being required and, and recommended, right? So had the masks, uh, have the social distancing grids, um, sanitizing everything. I think most of my budget has gone into cleaning Sanitary, products. Yeah. <laughs> um, sanitizing everything all the time. Um, my assistants, we laugh because they 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 were known as dance assistants. Now I call them my cleaning assistants. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know... Every, every day, you know, there's an assistant that's scheduled for each studio Mm -hmm. and that's their job. Anything that's touched, any, in between every class, um, you know, their main role is to make sure it's cleaned. Um, so, so let's see, what else have we done? Um, Oh, we, what was really cool that we learned, because I'm not tech savvy, and when we had to switch to virtual back in the spring... It was all foreign, you know, like, okay, I know how to set up a Zoom, but what does this even mean, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I feel like I'm getting this handle on it. And so all of our classes are live streamed for students. Mm-hmm. So say you're a parent and um, your child isn't feeling well. Well, we ask through our protocol that you don't come to the facility, but that it's live streamed. And mm-hmm. so the child doesn't have to miss a beat. Mm-hmm. And that live stream is recorded and it stays there for 30 days. So say in three days, Susie feels better. Well, she can take her dance class again. It's right there for her. You know what I mean? So parents, I think really, really appreciated that, that they didn't feel like they were missing out or their child wasn't missing out. Um, I had some families that chose to just virtually learn and they still are. They haven't come into the studio. They just want to virtually learn. And that's great. We have it set up for them, you know, and that's how they're... So the idea of a family's choice, right, of, of continuing with dance class. So I would say, obviously, the, the masking, the distancing, and the sanitation increase, and then being able to offer that live stream option um, to keep families that are were exposed to COVID or aren't feeling well. They can stay home and feel like they're not missing out, Um both in the classroom setting or financially. Mm-hmm. So, do you envision any of these things continuing? Mm-hmm. You know, when we're in a post-COVID world, is there anything <laughs> that like worked well that you're like, yeah, we need to incorporate this in? Yeah, I not? I really feel that we have dotted every I and crossed every T possible. I don't think any business can say that they're a hundred percent safe. Like, mm-hmm. I just I don't think, but I do feel that we have done such a great job. And not only do my, have I felt that from my parents, and again, going back to that overwhelming feeling, the outpour of families just encouraging me. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel great. I, I am choosing to do this virtually, but I'm coming to you in person, you know? like, And again, that's that choice, but, and that weight, right? But it's, it's so overwhelming that people feel 
good about the choices that I made to create the safest environment possible for their child to continue doing what their their love is or their passion is. Um, and so that's that's been exciting. The other thing that I would say is from the time we were open July until we were last shut down the week prior to no, um, Thanksgiving was we had zero transmission. So for a business to say that, at least known to me, and I tracked, you know, I asked parents to send me any information and I tracked it on a grid and, or on a spreadsheet. To, to, say, to say that, I think, speaks volumes too. Definitely. So, you know, will things change? I hope so. I hope so over time things start to change and when that is I don't know you know I don't think anyone really knows um but you know we'll just keep following the recommendations you know that are provided for us and follow the lead from our home office in regards to that too and um at the end of the day I just want kids to be able to continue being in person and continue getting instruction and continue exercising um you know One thing that I know we didn't discuss is just mental health of kids. Yeah. And I feel my job is so important right now for these kids and, and just being an advocate for them and their mental health and, and exercise. Um, so I, I love, love what I do and I just feel very pulled in that direction with our youth right now. So Anything to stay open at this point, yeah. <laughs> I will do. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, for my last question for you, mm-hmm. you know, why are you passionate about doing this work? Like, what drives you to get up and want to do this every day? It's been a rough year. <laughs> so, you know, what is it like, yep, yeah, I'm just going to, I love this. I want to continue doing yeah. this. What kind of drives you? Well, I think it's a personal drive. I think, you know, Growing up, I always, I was a goal setter. I'm, I continue to be a goal setter. So for me personally, um, I, I like to set goals and I like to achieve them. Now, over time, those goals have changed. So back when I started, my goal was maybe to offer really quality, great quality instruction and um, get as many kids in the door as possible and have a growing business, right, for, for myself and my family. Um, over time, that's evolved into continuing that right as a, as a running the studio here but tapping into the kids you know what what makes you tick how can I inspire you um, to make the best decisions for your journey in this life whether it's in dance or tomorrow they call me and they want to try softball but they are taking away something from our program that's in the back, ingrained in their head, right? Um, that they can do anything that they want to do if they work hard and have a passion and they're respectful and um, they have a, a, a teamwork uh, a feeling and understanding. And so to me, what drives me now is seeing that happen and taking place and, um, you know, getting getting the, the little cards that I, I don't quite know what's drawn on them, but it says, <laughs> love, Julie. And then I ask her, what, what did you draw today, Julie, you know? And she says, well, that's you, you know? And it's, oh, of course that's me. You know, that's beautiful, you know? And she's like, and that's me, you know? And we're holding hands, you know? It's two little stick hands holding, you know? And, oh, well, this is, you know, that is what... The fact that that child went home and said, I want to draw a picture of me and Coach Beth. Yeah. You know, and then bring it to her. And where do I put it? I put it on my wall. You know, um, I'm not looking for cards. I'm not looking for awards. You know, at the end of the day, I want each child to know that they matter. They matter in this world and um, have the possibility of doing anything that they want. You know, and I'm just hoping that I inspire them that way, you know, through my goal setting and, uh, I don't, you know, awards are great. This year I was director of the year, you yes. know, for just for kicks. And that was really, really exciting. But at the end of the day, I was like, I just wanted to get back to work. I wanted to go back and see the kids and get back in the studio. And, mm-hmm. um, so it's, it's funny, you know, 10 years ago, I maybe was looking for that award. Right. And now it's like, I'm, I'm humbled. I'm very honored. Um, 
you know, and being the best of the best dance studio for three years in a row. It's like, I love it. I'm humbled by it. But it's it's just on my wall. Mm-hmm. But what what's right next to it is the picture from the Julie, cars, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and I would look at that more than I would the award, you know. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's the kids. Yeah. The kids and their families, for sure. Well, I have some final fun questions for you. <laughs> yeah. I have, I asked on everybody, but you have a new set since you'll be the first one for 2021. Which okay. I'm making up on the spot right now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Hit me with it. <laughs> okay. Since we're in the holiday season, or we will, well, this will air slightly after, but sure. it's still holiday season. Yeah. What's one holiday tradition you're looking forward to? Ooh, well, tradition with family or tradition with Just for Kicks or? Either way. Well, it's gone a whole whole different route because December we did virtual classes. So with Just for Kicks, um, one thing that we started to do is snail mail. Okay, you know, kids, they're so used to texting and all this stuff. So um, we, kids usually have buddies that pump them up throughout the year. Well, we had to change it because we were virtual learning. And so we're having them do their normal fire up buddy stuff through the mail. (laughs) So they have to figure out how to write a letter and stamp it and send it in the mail. So that's one of my favorites is seeing the kids connect. Um, We're making um, Christmas cards for the elderly. So those that are in um, homes. I have a dance mom that works at um, one of the one of the homes or centers here in Rochester. And so there's a need. There's a need for elderly. And so I try to find the need in our community, I guess would be the tradition that we have at Just for Kicks. And this year it happens to be um, our older population. And so I'm getting kids to draw cards and make letters and Get those out. Within my own family, it's definitely uh, the sugar cookies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sugar cookies, Christmas Eve service, soups, <laughs> um, and of course some presents along the way too. So one of my goals for 2021 is to work on my mindset. Okay. Do you have any strategies, thoughts around having a positive and growth oriented mindset? What do you do for yourself to kind of Pump yourself up to Oh, that's good too. I'm a quote person. I love, I just love reading quotes. Um, and I don't have any quote for you right now memorized. Right. <laughs> As I said that, I'm like, wait a second. No, but sometimes it's just a matter of reading a quote and then how does that apply to me? And what could I do with that? Like if I were to quote something to someone else, you know, um, how does that how does that fit into my mold or what I'm trying to do? I, like I said, I've always been a goal setter. I think goal setting is huge. And I really feel that you become more successful by seeing those goals. And so, um, for me on the goal setting side, I, in my office every, every year I reassess myself after the end of the season and I put goals on my whiteboard and I don't number them. I don't put them in an order to complete. I put a star by them And so every day when I'm in my office, I see them. And if it's something, if it's a goal of a number, I kind of just put a, once a month we'll say, okay, so say my goal is to add 20 kids or something. And so I'll write up there 15 is where we're at on this date, you know? And then, Mm -hmm. so every day I'm seeing it and it's like, okay, I'm close to that goal. Or maybe I need to work on this one a little bit better to reach this goal. But they're a constant the whole season. Um, the positive mindset, I think, um, is, is a challenging one because I think you are your toughest critic, right? Um, and it's not necessarily that you're telling yourself you're not good enough, but I feel we think more on the negative side versus the positive. And so the more you can tell yourself that you are doing a good job, so I'll say, you know, I'll look at somebody like, gosh, I am doing a great job. But what more could I do? I was told to take the butt out of that. So I'm doing a good job. I think I could do some more. You know, like it's mm. kind of more how your, your perspective and how you're thinking about things. Having realistic goals, you know, and then your five-year goal, right? So you're not, you're not chasing after the five-year the whole time. You're, you're reaching goals as you're getting to that five-year mark um so I think the more positive you can stay towards yourself 
nice to yourself in what you're doing um, will help you continue to pursue that hard work and those goals that are along the way. So Yeah. No, it's so true. Any any even slight change in wording like mm-hmm. changes your perception of, of what, what's happening and your control over it. Yeah, well, and uh, one, I just sat in on um, a talk last week, and um, they used the word Q-tip. And uh, <laughs> hear me out with this. <laughs> I'm like, what does a Q-tip have to do with this conversation, right? And it was to remind me or the business owner to quit taking it personally. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's a simple way to remember it. It's cute, you know, because I think, too, in working with people, children, families, you know, really any age, at the end of the day, we're, we're working with people. And people have their own lives and, and, and how they respond to things. And um, sometimes, you know, people, you just happen to be the person that they're next to that they go crazy about, you know what I mean? And so I think that can be a part of your mindset too, where you take feedback or um, a response to something negatively. It doesn't have to be negative. Mm -hmm. It can be about growth and reevaluation, right? And um, how how could I pursue this differently? Does this person just need a hug? Well, it's COVID. I can't give a hug, but you know what I mean? Like, do they just need to be heard? You know? And so I just thought it was interesting last week when I heard Q-tip, because I think sometimes those situations that we're in or conversations we're in can set us back because we start to say, blaming ourselves, right? Or we sit on that negativity for too long and we're not able to move forward. You know, we're in this pit. And so I just thought the word Q-tip or that image of a Q-tip might help me too sometimes. Yeah, Um, I think so. And just being able to move forward, deal with it, but move forward and not take it personal. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Yeah, so that was my last question for you. So, (laughs) yeah, um, can you let people know where they can find Just for Kicks, both in person and on the web? Yeah, so um, you can go to justforkicks.com, and um, you'll type in your zip code, essentially, is the first thing you have to do. And then from there, you'll see programs that are within that a zip codes radius and so you'd look for just for kicks rochester program and click on that um and then you'll uh, that will give you then our website essentially so what's offered here in rochester um and then you're always welcome to call me and or email me and our location is 2130 south broadway so uh about kind of where like Walmart South is and the new Starbucks, Small Marshalls, and Alta Beauty. So right off of Broadway there, which is really nice too. So, Well, thanks so much for doing this today, coming mm-hmm. in and the whatever, finally getting to beat winter with the rain <laughs> and the nonsense going on. It's like there. the shortest day of winter, to, yes, or shortest is. day of the year that today or something. We're supposed to look in the sky tonight for yes. the, the Jupiter and Saturn. Yep, the Bethlehem uh, star the is Bethlehem, what I've yeah, heard. Yeah, the star. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which I'm gonna look when I when I get yeah, here. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, no, I appreciate your time. Thank you well, so thank much. Well thank you for so much this. too for the opportunity and you know, just to be able to speak to our community about just for kicks as a business, but more importantly, the opportunity for kids that we have here in Rochester. So I'm very blessed. So first off, I wanted to thank Bethany so much for taking time, especially during the holiday season, to sit down and have this conversation with us today and to really share her journey and her passion with Just for Kicks Rochester. As Bethany mentioned, you can find out more about Just for Kicks through the main website, justforkicks.com. And you can also find Just for Kicks Rochester on Facebook and Instagram. And we'll have those links in our show notes as well. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in to the podcast today. We really appreciate you taking an hour of your time to listen to stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. A big way you can help us is to like our podcast and rate it wherever you are listening in so that other people can find it. Make sure you also subscribe so you never miss a story of entrepreneurship and innovation coming out of Rochester, Minnesota. We'll be here next Wednesday with a brand new episode. 